my first question was, have you ever wondered why identical twins are so identical? Well, if you ask your local biologist or geneticist, they would probably tell you that's because they have the same DNA, right? They come from the same blueprint, the very same sperm, the very same egg. Co-twin similarities are a testament, really, to the power of DNA, to the power of the genetic code, and also to the notion that much of who we are and what we look like is predetermined before we're born. Almost every single human trait uh, has a heavy dependence on DNA sequence. Conrad Waddington described the exquisite reproducibility which twins highlight, the twin similarity highlights how reproducible development is. And Conrad Waddington coined this term canalization, a funneling, if you will, of development to repeat a singular endpoint. But are twins really so identical? That's the question. Well, studies in genetically inbred animals, so genetically identical animals, would tell us that yes, indeed, they are. The same DNA blueprint gives the same output reproducibly. But the variation can be striking. If we feed a high-fat diet to mice, we can have 100% variation in body weight. And nature has many other examples. Take the honeybee, the queen bee, the worker bee, two very different body plans. This is one genome that has the two blueprints in it. So one billion character code, two body plans, two blueprints, two behaviors. You take the horned beetle, these are two males, very different. The only thing that separates these two males is what they ate as larvae. When they were babies, one, the one with the horn had more soldier ants, worker ants, same thing. One genome, one DNA blueprint, two different body types. It's a concept called polyphenism. So indeed, some of the most spectacular variation that we find in nature can be traced to non-genetic variation, or as you'll know now, epigenetic variation. So what does this mean for humans? Well, we believe that this points to a hidden potential actually in every single one of us, in every single one of you. So we recently stumbled across a set of genes in mice that control canalization down to a singular endpoint. So if we compromise the activity of these genes by just 50%, we get a split in development, a bifurcation that gives us two very normal, but two very different types of mice. So same DNA, two very different types. One of them's bigger, stronger, faster growing, and stores more fat as adulthood. And recently we actually found there might even be a third type of mouse. Can you imagine that? Three different types of mice? I was thinking earlier, taking two German Shepherds and you get a Chihuahua. That was my... <laughs> it would be surprising, but it's true. So what about humans? Well, human monozygotic or identical twins show us indeed that many are similar, but there's about 10 to 15 percent actually that are quite different, up to 10 to 20 kilograms different in body weight, for instance. Our examinations of human children show us that there appear to be two different classes with their molecular features matching those of our two types of mice. So if each of us can come out as more than one form, well, I'd like to know who is Andrew number two, who is Andrew number three, maybe. Um, would I be more extroverted, bigger, smaller, taller? I'd really like to get to know the other me. If each one of us can come out as one of several different isoforms, I think the impact for society could be enormous. Take medicine, for instance. If I would have come out in my second form, would I be more or less susceptible to diabetes, cancer, autoimmunity, allergy? It means we have to reshape how we do medicine, a whole new generation of personalized medicine. How about the potential of our different selves? Would we respond differently to educational cues, to educational paradigms, social interactions? Would I be more or less extroverted, introverted, aggressive, willingness to go to war, for instance? This is going to reshape our expectations of both the individual and of societies. So now in the lab, we're just beginning to be able to control the ratios of big mice to small mice that we get from these same breedings. We do this just by changing the mother's diet. We already optimize human mother's diets, right? So this raises ethical implications. Would we be willing to control these factors if that changed fundamentally the person that comes out? So we're at the new understanding of life around us. Genetics is not everything. It's more malleable than we thought previously. I think we're, we have a rare opportunity now, and we must embrace this opportunity. Um, understanding our inner epigenetics could really be the key to unlocking the full potential in every single one of us. Thank you very much.